Dan Pinspeck, what is your favourite game? My favourite game is Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. So I guess um, I must have been about six, something like that, um, and uh, we managed to borrow an Atari 2600, which had uh, adventure and combat and stuff like that on it. Absolutely loved it. Um, Badgered my parents for donkeys afterwards until kind of eventually managed to combine Christmas and birthday and like every single relative that existed to get a ZX Spectrum, and that was it really, just completely fell for it and the idea you can make your own games and you know it's back in the time of when you had sort of like you know zap and computer magazines that would have the the code even if you're really lucky the machine code for a game in the back few page and you can actually type it copy it out and make a game so i kind of was really really obsessive about that and then got very into sort of um paper-based games dungeons and dragons and warhammer 40,000, paranoia pretty much anything that was going um, when i was a teenager but then sort of really got out of games again um when i was in my early 20s i was broke and um, didn't have enough money for a console or anything else. I guess it was must have been uh, kind of mid-90s, borrowed a PlayStation off a friend, and um, the first game I played in probably five or six years was Tomb Raider 3, and I just remember putting it on and thinking, oh, 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 yeah, all right, okay, I remember this, I remember this feeling. And, um, yeah, I've just, just kind of loved them ever since. So mm. a few years later, I was um, I, I worked in, in digital art for a while, and um, I got a job um, at the University of Portsmouth because they were trying to uh, do this new um, school, which was part computer science, part arts. And part of it was to um, do a PhD, and I was doing a PhD on story and virtual reality, and um, was kind of getting to a point in this PhD where I was going to have to build something to do experiments, and I'm, I'm not hugely technical, and I was like, okay, this could well be a bit of a problem. And I was playing, I think it was Time Splitters, and sat there and suddenly went, hang on a minute, wait a second. These things are mass market virtual realities, and I love them, and I've been playing them all my life. Why am I not doing a PhD on first-person shooters? So kind of taught my way into that. And um, as part of the PhD, was getting very frustrated with a lot of academic game study stuff about what game could be and couldn't be and could do and couldn't do, and all those kind of definitions. And one of them going around was where the story and gameplay were incompatible or whether they were separate things and all this kind of stuff. And I was kind of doing the PhD on it, and really kind of got to a point where I thought... I can either just theorise about this stuff or we can kind of just try and make something um, and see if it works. And that seems like a more kind of um, appropriate way of asking a question about a game. Can a game do this? Can a game do that? So um, because I've been, I'd like modded Doom and and that sort of stuff before. So it suddenly sort of felt like the right thing to do would be to make some mods, stick them out in the public domain and just see what people think of them. And if they like them and reckon they work, then that's a pretty good way of answering the question of whether something works or not rather than going through you know, a very, very academic sort of theoretical process of trying to define whether or not something works, of saying, well, let's just put it out there, go to players and see if it works. So I made a couple of mods, and one of them's Dear Esther, and it did pretty well, and that was it, really. Suddenly we were game developers. So, yeah, it wasn't exactly a kind of a strategic, I'm going to work in the games industry. I mean, up until Esther kind of went mental, I still don't think I could had any concept of the idea that I could work in the games industry or there was there was a kind of a job like the one I have now. Um, so, yeah, I kind of fell into it, really. Kind of fell back into a lifelong passion, I suppose. Mm. Um, so, kind of rewinding back to that kind of childhood start now with the CX Spectrum, like, what games were you getting into at the time? Like, from the emails we were passing around before we started getting uh, into, into you know, recording, like, you mentioned Attic Attack and School Days, like... Yeah, what, what, oh, I loved oh, Attic Attack, Night Law, that whole kind of, like, uh, the, the top-down kind of adventure shooters were, were amazing. They were just, you know, kind of 
completely obsessive. I think one of the first games I ever made was like a procedural version of one of those. Um, mainly on the basis that procedural stuff was a lot easier to, to make back then than anything we actually had to do, like level design and layouts and stuff like that. Um, and School Days, I guess, was... School Days was so interesting because it was such a, a weird game. It was kind of, you know, basically a, a, a side-scrolling adventure, really, I guess, with, with a lot of cascading design sequences in it. But it was... It just had a thing about it which made it really interesting. It had real character. And I think a lot of those early Spectrum games, and, and C64 games as well, I guess, but they were the enemy. Um, they were just weird because they had, because they were kind of like, you know, a couple of people max, but often just one person. It was kind of the real era of kind of Jeff Minter type developers just going, well, I've got an idea. So they just throw this stuff out there and it'd be completely crazy. And things like, you know, Pajama Armor and um, Jet Set Willy. Um, that were just, I don't know, you kind of look back at it and you go, I have no idea where this stuff was coming from. But even with the kind of the recent kind of indie explosion that happened, you know, I guess what, sort of like four or five years ago, hmm. oh, yeah. actually it's fairly conservative compared to the kind of stuff that was getting pumped out in, in the 80s in terms of just, yeah, people were just having an idea and just slapping it down onto, onto a cassette and, and sticking it out there. And there was, there was no kind of sense of, this is what a game should be or this is what a game shouldn't be. It's like if you could code it, you could sell it. Um, and so it meant it was a, a, a really quite, quite weird, kind of wild bunch of games coming out there. Mm. Um, now, it's interesting you mentioned that kind of indie revolution because the, uh, from four or five years ago, because obviously you think of Braid and Journey and and to, to an extent Rapture and uh, Dear Esther, but like it's, I'm glad to have be, be around for this kind of indie revolution because like this f- feels, feels like indie revolution 2.0 whereas like you said back in the 80s there was that kind of first big explosion of indies so to speak with the Atari and Spectrum era. Yeah well I mean the games the games industry's history is, is, is independent development. Um, it takes quite a long time before it starts becoming a, a kind of a corporate industry and kind of modern gaming history is kind of written about kind of like, you know, giants like Microsoft, Sony and, you know, Sega, Konami, those big publishers. But it's not how it started. You know, it started off with with kind of tiny independents kind of just basically, you know, selling stuff through mail order and this kind of thing. So I think I always find that kind of it's quite interesting to, to kind of go back and look at it. I mean, from my point of view, I think, you know, being that, I guess, even though I've not been in development as long as a lot of those those sort of real, the people that are now the kind of real heavyweights, the real kind of old school emperors and empresses of, of, of gaming now, I'm the same age as them. And it means that for me, I don't think any of the kind of the kind of territorial stuff that, that, that we hear a lot around, is this a game or should this be or shouldn't it be, or what general that kind of stuff, it's just, I find it completely meaningless because I grew up on stuff where, it, was it a game? Did it come on a cassette? Did it run? It's a game. This wasn't. It was an irrelevance whether or not it fitted any kind of like formal theoretical definition of what should be or shouldn't be. Um, and I think that's really important. And I think it's, you know, particularly with with, with kind of gaming now and where it's going, all different directions it's going, and it feels more like it's fulfilling the promise of the of the early eighties of saying this is a really really free space. It's a really a space where if you can think of it and you can create it, you will find an audience for it. Um, and that's, you know, that's really important for me. It's kind of, it feels like it's uh, it's what it should be. So jumping forward to, to the PS1 era, like you mentioned the first uh, Tomb Raider games as well, like in our emails. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, go into that, kind of go into that little obsession a bit. <laughs> I put, yeah, I put months of my life into early Tomb Raider games. I played them all recently, actually. Um, I mean, really stand up. I mean, they're absolutely amazing games. The kind of, it's, I think a lot of the stuff in that era is really, I mean, it is pretty flawed, you know, it's kind of by today's standards, but there's something, the design is so exposed in it. Whereas like now, if you're making a game now, you've got a very large number of ways in which you can sweep a player along. You can put outstanding visuals, audio in there. Um, you've got an awful lot more stuff you can throw at the screen an awful lot more quickly. And it's very, I think particularly a lot of AAA games can be, you can kind of hide some of the flaws a lot more easily. You get back to those kind of like early, that sort of era of games, and there's just no, you know, there's no audio, there's no visuals. It's, it's really exposed. It's got to kind of work in terms of, of the design and the flow. So they're really interesting for that. 
But I think for me, the key thing that I was just, I think at that kind of age of coming back to it, well, after a sort of, I guess, a break of probably, you know, five or six years, something like that, of realising the kind of worlds you could suddenly pack onto a disc. And that was really new. Like, I couldn't, it completely took the top of my head off the kind of scale that the Team Raider games were dealing with. Those amazing camera pullbacks, like I really remember it in the uh, in the very first one. I mean, it was kind of, you know, I really, really loved it and I was really, really into it. But the moment which sticks with me is the, the point in, um, uh, it's in the third the third section where it's needed. I think it's the um, the, the Scion um, Temple. Where he's coming out of legend, the camera just pulls back and it pulls back and it pulls back and it keeps on pulling back. And he's sitting there thinking, fuck, when's it going to stop pulling back? This place is massive. And it was a real just moment of being so excited about the potential of what could be done. Um, and then I think after... You know, sort of after those, I guess a little bit later than that, the, the game which I think was probably more formative than, than anything else in that period was, was Soul Reaver Legacy of Cain, which had that, the writing was just terrific. It was fantastic, and you had a brilliant level design, great world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Amy Hennig. I just think she's, she's one of our greats in the industry. And she really has that. Sorry? I agree. I absolutely agree. And like uh, I can also see why uh, you mentioned Soul Reaver there as well in terms of writing and design because not only Amy Hennig but Richard Lamarson as well. Yeah, he's yeah, I mean and he's a fantastic designer and really uh, I think a real lost the games industry when he came out into academia. I think he has so you know, it's such a smart so I mean one of the smartest people I think I've ever met. I mean really quite scary smart. Um yeah, I just think as a pairing, they were just, just amazing. But I think what really, really did it for me for, with Soul Reaver more than anything else, which I think really has stayed with me, was there were whole areas in Soul Reaver where there wasn't really anything there. Like, you might find a glyph at the top of Nut Raptor's Retreat or something like that, but it would take you, like, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to get there, and there'd be, like, one glyph and nothing else. And it would be world for no other reason than the fact that being in a world feels amazing if the world is well-crafted. And that was it's one of those things that I, I just go back to and back to and back to and that idea of one of the greatest things about games is that we can create these worlds and you can actually get in them and wander around them I mean that's at the, the root of you know I'd say it's at the root of System Shock it's at the root of Shadow of the Colossus certainly a stalker and absolutely it's, it's you know it's kind of the fundamental thing about the games that we make of saying we can make this world and you can get in it and that is so extraordinary in itself I just yeah, I, it's something that ex, I'm as, as excited about now as I was, like you know, fifteen, twenty years ago. Mm. I I just want to jump quickly back onto Amy Hennig and all because, like, I've said this on Twitter, but I, I'm going to say this on on this here because I've never actually said it here. I think going back to Uncharted Two, the reason why that worked so incredibly well, and why the other games have been great like that one is just so far beyond anything else in that series with the exception of Orcs obviously of course not out yet as, as of recording this is because of that pairing of Hennig and the Marshall as well as Neil Druckmann and Bruce Drake combine those four together I think you have one of the best core teams in games if not the best core team in games I think I've ever seen develop a game yeah I think you have when you're lucky and it happens very occasionally you get those periods where the right people come together in the same place at the same time and something really extraordinary happens. And I don't think it ever lasts. And I think it's good that it doesn't ever last because it should keep moving on. But you kind of get it, those times when you go, like Id, um, you know, when they made Doom, where you just go, it just was the right people in the right room at the right time and just that powder keg of amazing stuff that just comes out of it. And, it, yeah, it just felt like, yeah, I loved one and three. Two is just it's, it's a juggernaut of a game. It just, but it really understands that. I think I, I heard um, Amy Hennig talk at GDC a couple of years ago, and she was talking about kind of her thesis was was kind of came down to going. Um, there is it's not even that there's nothing wrong with escapism, but entertainment for entertainment's sake has a really profoundly important social value, and it's really good to be. To, to make something that just makes people feel great is actually a very noble thing to be doing. And I think you can really feel that in Uncharted, this idea of going, we're going to make something which is just going to sweep people off their feet, but it's going to be 
just an amazingly fun ride that you're going to finish at the end of it and go, I'm so glad I did that with my life for that time. And I think that you can feel that in the game. You can feel a real joy of making it, that they kind of knew that they were doing something really special and it's really infectious. And that's really hard. And that to me is it, all of my favourite games, you can feel that excitement, that buzz. You can feel a development team that are going, this is really worth it. You can feel that passion in there. It's really, really hard to kind of quantify or break down, but I kind of, I could be completely wrong as well. It could be sort of like games that you kind of feel that actually they were just miserable experiences for the development team. But I don't know. There's a, a passion, I think, comes through. You can kind of see it in a, an, an attention to detail, a kind of a, a willingness to, even if it's painful, to loop back over and just refine things one more time. Mm. Yeah, I think it's got that. I think Uncharted 2 absolutely has that. Mm. Um, just to slightly jump back even a bit further back to Tomb Raider like I've played it in the recent games like I think Rise of Tomb Raider really fucking bangs out of the park basically yeah for me. I think it's terrific I think it's an absolutely amazing game it's so slick but it doesn't feel empty like the first one I kind of I, I, I liked I wanted to like much more than I actually did and parts of it really really pissed me off <laughs> um, the second one it kind of it definitely was... It had that thing coming back again. There's still stuff, bits of it I don't like. I still want more Tomb, less arena shootouts. Um, and I still find the characterization of Lara Croft a bit annoying. Um, because I just, I don't know... I'm kind of old school with Tomb Raider, and, and Lara was always a bit of a psycho. And you kind of got the feel that she, she quite happily kind of... She was really had that sort of toughness and that uncompromising this. And it really... I think that was an important part of the character. I'm not as convinced by the... Um, she kind of does things that are really... You kind of go, okay, that's really... It is... I mean, I know a lot of people have talked about it, a kind of um, ludonarrative dissonance. But you kind of have this kind of like big kind of thing where you're thinking, okay, she's really I'm doing this this is the character I'm playing I understand it and then you get to a voiceover and it's all kind of like well I feel really I'm self-doubting I'm questioning myself all the time and it just doesn't ring 100% true um, but it's just just sort of taste but in terms of the atmosphere and the mechanics and the flow and the pacing it's just yeah it's superb um, it's an amazingly crafted game and a real art to have rebooted the uh, um, the kind of the franchise in that way and to have the kind of confidence to go now we're making this game now we're not going to try and ape the past we're going to make a modern game to try and understand what was so special about the old games and, and re-inject that into the heart of it so we've already touched upon how you first got in the industry so we can skip that sort of thing uh, unless you want to get into how Chinese Room was kind of format, formatted or set up this uh, yeah I don't well I don't think there was any particular you know massive again strategy behind Chinese room it was really you know it started off as just being a, we had to give the team well I say team at that point and really it was kind of it was, it was me and Jess and a couple of students when we were making the mods um, and we just had had it, it was just a, a name that we used for it and we think at that point we thought it was going to be a studio and then you know it was the three of us it was me and Jess and Rob on the, the Dear Esther remake and I think there wasn't any again any great, great kind of plan there I mean when that was was coming out we, we turned it from a mod into a commercial game because we needed partially because we needed to have some way of generating some income um, in order to be able to license the tech and to be able to afford to pay musicians and to pay Nigel the, the performer and we kind of thought at the same time I was kind of like really conscious that Rob and Jess had given a lot of their time for nothing and I was still working full time as, as a researcher when I made it um, so the idea was if we commercialised it then they might get a few quid um, and it would kind of be a, a bit of a, a you know a way of making up some of the time they put into it. Um, and then when it went nuts, really, it was um, I think by the time I think by the time it came out, we were already talking to Frictional about making Machine for Pigs, and um, we sort of put together a team for Machine for Pigs. But again, we weren't a commercial studio at that point. It was just still a kind of a, a, a name for the stuff we were doing. And actually, me and all the other the Machine for Pigs team were employed by the university I was still working at. It was only when we started Rapture that we actually kind of came out and, and started working as a, as a full professional studio so we're three games in but actually we've only really made one of them as a, as a pro game dev studio which is kind of interesting and I think Rapture was really for us was alongside making the game was a process of becoming a professional studio and kind of really understanding everything that goes along with that good and bad so 
Let's get into your favourite game then, Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. So like, what kind of got you first into Stalker um, before you know, kind of playing it? Like what, what kind of made you interested into the game? Well I was doing, at the time I was doing a PhD on first person shooters and I was looking at the relationship between story and gameplay in 40 first person shooters between Half-Life right up till sort of like the point when it finished, I think it was 2008. So I was playing every single shooter probably three or four times and having a, a kind of like a completely psychotic kind of number of notebooks and maps and sketches and stuff like that so I was going through it like Trace and all this kind of stuff so Stalker was on the list of, of games to play that had come out and people were sort of saying oh it's really different it's really interesting it's got a great sense of world um, and I kind of got a copy of it and looked at it and thought oh, I'm a bit of a sucker for this I really like the sound of this it's really weird it's really ambiguous it's kind of doing that um, thing where it's really difficult so you can't just run and gun I mean I love run and gun shooters but it was like felt like way different to that and it just didn't read like anything else really and then I really kind of remember just putting the disc in the machine loading it up starting to play it and then kind of sitting there about three hours later and thinking fuck this is just extraordinary I think at that point I'd already stabbed someone in the back to steal their bread. Um, I'd like bled to death whilst trying to get back off a mission. I'd hardly done anything in terms of, of progression in the game. But I remember I'd hidden in a roof, in a burnout rooftop for quite a long time, waiting for it to go dark so I could sneak away because I had no bullets. And all that kind of stuff going on in the shooter, whilst you're watching the A-Life system, just life go on around you, was just... It was just like completely blown away, just like this is... It wasn't like another game I've played in so long. And then you have the anomalies on top of that of going, so, so no matter how powerful I get, I can still run into something if I'm not careful and it can kill me instantly. Um, and I can still die of radiation poisoning just because I'm just too far away from where I need to be. And I'm getting reduced to kind of like killing random strangers on the hope that they might have a bottle of vodka that I can de-irradiate myself for a few minutes with. Uh, it was just something really very, very special about how brutal that was. And then you had this world that was just... had that really hard-to-quantify thing of it just was soul. It just had... It felt like a place. You really understood the zone as not just a backdrop, not just a another game environment. It was really special. And you wanted to be in it and explore it. And it was frightening and strange and beautiful. And it didn't look like anything else. It didn't behave like anything else. But you you felt like it was a real place. It had that. It's so hard, so unbelievably difficult to achieve that. Um, and I think the thing, my only disappointment with Stalker was always, I was always so gutted when I hit the end of a level. Um, and you kind of went, oh, I am playing a game. This isn't going to go on forever. Because you just, I think if, the game was infinite. I don't think I'd ever have stopped playing it. I think I'd still be playing it now. I mean, it's just, it just has that thing. I can't imagine getting bored of it. And I must have played it and the sequels more times than any other game. I've just gone back and back and back to them just to kind of get the fix of, of what the zone feels like, really. Like, would you be willing to put in the context how many hours you've put into the first game in hours? <sighs> no, I don't know. Um, I mean, I've completed it four, five, six times, something like that. Um, so it's got to be, I mean, it has to be kind of like popping sort of like 120, 130 hours, something like that, which is not as much as I put in someone like Just Cause 2. I mean, Just Cause 2, I think I'm about, I've got up to about 170 when I thought I really ought to stop playing this. <laughs> Nothing else for about six months. Everyone's like, you're playing lots of games, Dan? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm playing lots of Just Cause. That's all it is. And I'm already, I'm on my way with Just Cause 3 at the moment. But um, yeah, if you put all three of them together, plus Oblivion Lost, plus Lost Alpha, plus Misery, plus all the other mods that have gone in, 
I've got to be on to, you know, uh, it's got to be well over 200, 200 hours plus on it. I know there's not a lot for, um, you know, if you're sort of doing big multiplayer stuff, you can, you can ratchet up that kind of hour count fairly quickly. Oh, yeah. Um, but there's something about it, as a, as a, it's the, the single player game, I think, that I can just go back to and back to and back to. And there's definitely part of that is because of the, you know, it, it is fairly sort of, Procedural is the wrong word, but it's it's pretty emergent. You know, you, you can have radically different experiences when you go out there, even when you know the game backwards. Buy me. <laughs> That's two hundred hours. I can't, I can't, I don't even know if I if I could ever see myself spending that much time in the game. It's not yeah, but is that how many hours in a year? A lot, a lot. I've probably done that. And someone will write in and go, "No, that's actually that means you've been playing it for longer than the game's been in existence." Um, but there's been yes, it's 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 an awful lot of time. I think at most I've put in like 120, 130 hours in the Grand Theft Auto 4 so I think no you have me beat there I had, I had something along that lines in, in um, Skyrim but Skyrim is weird because I mean it's, it's actually quite a small world compared to those it's definitely it's repeat play which gets it of just going um, I don't know it's not even you know it's not even that you, you go back and it is vastly different you kind of by the time you've gone back there a few times you know where the key artifacts are you know where the the kind of the key jumps on what you should be doing. I just, I just love the world. I really, really love the world. I was so, I think one of the most gutted moments I've had as a, as a gamer when they cancelled Stalker 2, I was absolutely kind of devastated by it. I go, you can't cancel this. This is too important. This is such an important game. Um, so, yeah. And it's the one game that you kind of go in your, in your kind of like fantasy development life is there a game you would you would ever love to make? And it's always been sort of that. But I just kind of know at the same time you probably should never make the games that you love because uh, you end up not loving them so much by the end of it. But mm. to make a game as I would feel like I could retire happy if I made a game like Stalker. That'd be that would be very interesting to see because I've I've never played Stalker. I do have a copy of it on Steam. Like I when I was at VT twenty four seven five years ago, like we had a secret Santa thing done internally. And one of our freelancers uh, at the time uh, got me a copy of Stalker, and I still did touch it. Oh, to be fair, like I said, my PC um, is on the fret, so I can't really play it right now. So, but I really want to play it now. And I put it like that. So, if I was if I was to go into Stalker today, basically, if the PC was fine as it is, it was in tip-top shape, what what would you give me as the elevator pitch on Stalker? Oh, let me think. Um. It's the only first-person shooter where you'll kill for bread. <laughs> and that's it. You know, and it's the only first-person shooter where you'll kill for bread with a knife because you're trying to save your last bullet in case you really need it. I mean, it is the... It's no stalk and no day to day. It's, uh, it's, the, it's the, 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 the archetype of survival shooters. It's where it all begins. Ooh, I haven't really... I'll be honest, I've not really associated Daisy with Stalker until you just mentioned it. That's... Huh. Well, that's what I get for being blind half the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it doesn't come out of nowhere, you know. Also, you look at Stalker and you trace it back to System Shock, I think, you know, in terms of a resource-gathering-based kind of shooter as well. But no, it's just... It's the only game, I think, still, one of the only games where I've been a bit freaked out by games I've been kind of like had jump scares and stuff like that it's the only shooter that I think is properly genuinely scary um, mm. in a way that few others are partially because it is it is kind of unpredictable and that does lead to you know kind of the occasional things happening which are kind of a bit weird and buggy and it is you know quite a buggy game but you it's, I guess there's no it's no surprise really that I play a, a lot of Just Cause as well that it's that that what you get from that bugginess is you get unpredictability, but it's not fully procedural. So you also get a really beautifully sculpted experience. But then you just get the opportunity to see things occasionally where, you know, you'll just be, you know, you, you're sort of there, sort of like camping out, trying to sort of like recharge or whatever in, in the roof of a burnout house, and you can see a, a couple of stalkers who've wandered around, wandered along, and then sat down sort of by a fire, and they're sort of like, you know, one pulls out a guitar, and they're sort of playing guitar, and sort of doing this sort of stuff, and then they just get jumped by a pack of, of wild boars out of nowhere, and you know you're just seeing the a life system play itself through, and this kind of thing, but then you've got this great thing, you'll be sitting there, and you've binoculars watching these guys get torn apart by boars, and all you're thinking is, I wonder if they've got some beans I could nick, 
And that's brilliant. <laughs> you kind of there wait for these things to go out, and then the boars wander off. You're like, you know, tip or tiptoe over there and steal all their food. And then you have this sort of weird sense of kind of going, it's that's just kind of what the game is. And, and it gets it changes as you go through as you start to get start getting more sort of powerful and you know, you do you're not quite in that same sort of real every second counts kind of survival thing. But for at least for the first the first part of the game, you, you you're you know, you're avoiding firefights. You're crapping yourself if anything that looks vaguely mutated comes near you. Um, if there's anything that happens on the screen, you're there sort of trying to work out if it's a visual glitch or whether you're about to burst into flames. It's just got that real stressed, really, really tense, but really eerie kind of thing going on as well. And that's really hard to do. It's, it's kind of easy to do stressed and panicky, but it quite often gets a bit boring. It's very hard to make that a beautiful experience. And I think they really manage that, where you just kind of sit back sometimes and just go... This world's gorgeous. It's just beautiful. And I think they kind of blew Fallout out of the water in terms of understanding how beautiful a destroyed world could be. Like, you mentioned the kind of tense, the, the, the tense, tenseness of the, the tension of it. Um, and, and of other games in the genre, like, like, what games do you think nail tension very well in terms of shooters and besides Stalker? I, I, like obviously the first obvious options that come to my mind is the Metro games. I and mean, we'll touch upon the Metro games in proper detail and but but like what other games like stood out for you in terms of tension that could be that could be on par or slightly less below Stalker in terms of shooters and tension. I mean, for me, I, I mean, I, I guess it's the kind of it's the in a lot of ways it's the precursor to Stalker. But I think System Shock Two absolutely had that in spades, um, and and Thief was pretty good at it as well. I think it's less less common now, ironically, in a lot of ways. Uh, Far Cry Two is really really good at it. Uh, just that sort of anticipation of going, it's all going to kick off in a minute. Um, I think. A lot of modern shooters, I love them, but they're very, they're so concerned with signposting where you are and what you should be feeling and what should be going on and what submissions you've got and where the collectibles are. It's very difficult to maintain that kind of tension in a kind of Ubi map. And that's, I think, is a bit of a shame and it's a bit of something that is, is, is often quite lost in them. Um, so it's not, I don't know, yeah, I mean... There probably are sort of modern shooters that have done it as much. Not, not really. I mean, I think for me the the kind of the shoot of the last couple of years is Wolfenstein, and that's a long way away. It's almost at the other end of the spectrum to uh, mm. to, to, to stalker. But I feel like we're better at that kind of thing than we're still really bothered by emptiness in games. It's still really um, it's really unusual. It's, it's, we still have this kind of weird knee jerk fear of kind of like nature goring a vacuum that if you if you leave an empty gap in a game then people are going to get bored straight away um, and I think what's really interesting about I mean, most of the games that I've talked about I mean, with the exception of Just Cause but you look at kind of like early Tomb Raiders um, Legacy of Kane, Shadow of Colossus System Shock, Stalker um, early Far Cry well, Far Cry 2 these are games with big patches of nothing in them um, Uncharted does it as well and big patches of nothing are, are really important for game design because it's time when as a player you start you, you have if you drop away kind of like making you have to think and act and respond all the time when that stuff drops away that's when your imagination can really kind of start working yeah and if you leave space for the player's imagination in your game i absolutely passionately believe that's when you get really special game experiences so I think, yeah, I mean, you've got things. I mean, even Doom's really interesting. Doom's got kind of places where you just have those things where you go, shit, and, like, the Mars base feels empty. Mm. You get those glimmers of senses of, of kind of, like, scale and place in there. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't, it's not... I don't think it's a very common design thing in shoots. I think they, they, we, we're definitely in a, in a fashion for much more frenetic kind mm. of action. Mm, like... Maybe I misinterpreted uh, what what you said, but like when you do have those kind of quiet down times in games, like like you said, it it drives your imagination wild, like of what could happen next or or whatever. And like the one moment that springs out to me, in terms of that kind of quiet downtime that lets you think, 
is Uncharted 2 in the Himalayas where yeah. Drake, Drake's just walking along and the kids are all playing football That like that's the big one that springs out to me yeah I mean it's just an amazing moment to play in a AAA game just absolutely extraordinary and that's you know that's, that's kind of going to be I think probably be Richard the Martian's finest hour it'll be seen as that getting the Tibetan village sequence in which is just it's beautiful right and it's it's so beautiful because you built up this amazing rapport with Drake and I think for me still the thing which makes um, Uncharted is Drake and Sully the Drake-Sully relationship is so effortlessly believable and charming and warm and yeah you just you're so invested in those characters so you already really really know Drake by the time it happens and it's kind of a time where you can just go actually I can just enjoy like, like I'm hanging out with Drake at this point and he's quite a cool person to hang out with and he gave that real amazing breather at the centre of the game just to go, okay, this is just this is just a world. And I think it's that again it, it come, I think those games again it comes back with stuff like Stalker, Metro, which say we'll talk about in a minute, does it amazingly in the way that it handles the stations. Far Cry two does it really, really well as well. Just going it's like like if you're looking at like graphic design, right? So like the Google homepage. Google homepage is brilliant because there's nothing on it because it's got all this blank space and space always costs money in print design. So if you leave blank space, you kind of you're making a statement of confidence, going, we can afford to not fill this, we can afford to leave this blank because it's that good. And it's like that's similar to that sort of thing of, of early games where they're so sort of exposed. And I think to do nothing gives the game world a real confidence. Like to have to put things in which aren't needed and stalker does this stalker has whole building complexes where there's no mission there there's no gameplay objective it's just a building it's just there to add world to add atmosphere to the world and that gives it a disproportionate sense of place that really really sucks you in far cry i mean the all of the far cry games are really really good at those little vignettes that you just find when you're exploring you go wow what happened here and it just captures your imagination a little bit and i think the tibetan village is really the same sort of principle of just going it doesn't, because it's not asking you to solve anything and it's not a, a, an environment or a piece of game which is presented as a problem that you've got to figure out or be. It gives you a space to just be a person in it and for your imagination and, and to have an emotional reaction to it. Um, and that's why I think it's such an amazing sequence because you just go, I don't have to solve the Tibetan village, I can just enjoy being in the Tibetan village. And actually, the problem solving part of my brain is switched off which means other parts of my brain can focus on this experience I'm having. Um, and I think that as a, as a designer, that's something which has always really stayed with me of going, if you present a problem, then the player's going to sit down in front of it and they're going to try and figure out how to solve that problem. And that's going to be the primary thing they're focused on. And it's going to be much, much harder for you to sell a really deep, rich, convincing world if actually you've kind of made your world a place that has to be mined for an answer or it's become a key that you have to rotate in a lock in a certain way in order to go forwards. So I think it's really important to have those spaces in your design where you're saying, you don't have to do anything at this point apart from just be in the world. And again, for me, you know, kind of my, my kind of like formative games were things like Tomb Raider and, and Soul Reaper where there was an awful lot of that sense of going, you're kind of vaguely figuring out that if I jump over there and crawl under that and pull that lever and this something, but it's very, very loose and spaced out, and you can have whole chunks of time where really you're just pottering around an Aztec ruin, mm. um, and that's that's really, really powerful stuff. Mm. It's it's basically simplicity to it in a sense. Yeah, and Shadow of the Colossus, I mean, is is like the the apex of that, right? I mean, it's just you kind of. I mean, the way I play, I was kind of like, okay, ah, oh, balls, I've got to get, another, get no, go through another Colossus, because I actually just want to get rid through the Colossus so I can get back into the into the land, because that's where it's really exciting. Um, and what can I find next? And there's sort of whole areas of that where you just have that, but it has that anticipation. You kind of know that there is a Colossus somewhere in the mist ahead of you somewhere, but to get there, you're going through these amazing ruins. And the, and the brilliance of, of that which is the other thing which I think they share with um, things like Stalker and I think quite a lot of modern games are quite bad at, is they never explain it. They just go, do you know what, there is no explanation that we can write that's going to be as 
compelling and interesting as the explanation that you can come up with in your own imagination. So we're just going to give you just enough pieces and then it's up to you. It's your story. Um, and we're not going to try and turn it into this big kind of like process of, of just kind of hammering exposition at you until you're kind of beaten in submission and you accept it's our way of, of understanding the world. Um, yeah, and that's, I mean, again, Uncharted also, that's the other thing the Tibetan sequence did is it didn't, it didn't say, here is a Tibetan sequence. By the end of it, you must be feeling X, Y, Z. You must have kicked three bulls, punched three cows, and said seven villages. It just went, it's yours. You have it. And that was a really nice kind of a real break in, you know, because it's fairly scripted as a game. There's a fairly close racing line through Uncharted, and it really gave you a bit of a moment of saying, okay, here's your reward. Just have fun in this place for a little while. I think Naughty Dog does this really well, not just with Uncharted, but actually with The Last of Us as well. It gives you those kind of quiet, reflective moments at times yeah. where it, it, like, it does just calms down your mind a little bit of like oh my god I must do this oh my god I must do that it just gives you time to think and just yeah stuff like that yeah I think it's really important I think you can't there are there are some emotions you can feel under pressure and there's some emotions you can feel when you're trying to juggle an awful lot of balls and there are some emotions which is just impossible you can't feel sad in the middle of a firefight Mm. it's almost impossible you can't feel reflective and, and kind of um, like you can feel awe but you can't feel wonder and there's like there are fast emotions and slow emotions and it's really important to have time and spaces for where those slow emotions can, can function in a game or you get something which is you know kind of fairly one dimensional and that's you know it's not inherently like a bad thing it's not saying all games have to include that kind of stuff I think it's really important that you know we have as many games that are you know, they are fairly emotionally one-dimensional. It doesn't mean to say they're not a huge amount of fun. Mm. Um, but it's really special when you find those games which give you both. Mm. Absolutely. Um, so, jumping completely back into soccer, then, um, like, it allowed you to explore that world. Like, for all the troubles in the world, or in that world, like, of, you know, the enemies, the radio, uh, activity of that world, like, it offered the player room to explore. It was open-ended gameplay. Like, how did you kind of find that? Um, getting into the game. I mean, I love exploring. I think, I think, and for me, that's a that's a big part of, I guess, you know, as a player, as a designer, is explorations just is is an enormously rewarding part of being in a game. I, I love the idea of just going. I can just wander off here and go and find things. So that's it's, it's, for me. It's like complete catnip. I'm. I'm always happier with that than having a very very tight line i don't mind having a really really constrained linear game experience the thing which i get really frustrated by is games that, that tell you you've got a, a, an open experience and then force you down the line um which i think is probably fairly common kind of attitude so i don't mind it if i'm just playing a corridor like wolfenstein was just a corridor shooter yeah. but it's a really good corridor shooter and he didn't pretend it was anything other than that i agree yeah. and it's when you kind of have games that go you can go anywhere you want. You just can't go there or there or there. And actually, you need to go here. And then from here, you have to do this. And then you have to do this. And that's when it gets a bit, I don't know. And I like, I think it's really hard because it's, I mean, partially, I think it's a money thing, you know, right? It's, it's kind of, you know, when you're building a game that, you know, you've got a certain amount of time and, you know, you know how much every asset costs. And, and most, you know, games that are, being budgeted really, really carefully will say, I've got to get X amount out of Y asset because otherwise, why we bought the justification for making an asset unless it's going to get a decent amount of use. Um, and I think, again, it's where Stalker is really kind of interesting because there's this, it's like the least economically well built game ever because there's all this unique shit in it that doesn't serve any purpose. But it does because actually that's what makes the world for great because you can go exploring. And it's a bit like um, the, the first day of sex where. You know, you can play Dare Sex a few times. You need to go back to it and still finding things. But it always felt like a game that when you found it, you'd, you'd go somewhere and you'd think you were being really smart and really clever and going, I've just found a way through this or out of this or into this new space. And then you get there and they they were there already. The designers had, had already left something for you there going, hey, congratulations, you found this really cool place that no one's going to find. But we, we found it felt like it was very kind of um, giving as a game. It really understood the efforts you made to explore. And, um, yeah, so I think 
I think you know there's a there's a similarity between like yeah the first the first day of sex and stalker in that regard. You you fell in stalker that if you went exploring, there would be something for you to find. It wouldn't be something that would necessarily give you any stat changes. It wouldn't necessarily solve a mission, but it would be a place that felt good or looked good or just was somewhere that you were excited to explore. And the world was its own reward. I think that's a really hard thing to get in, in, in sort of when you're, you're doing world design is if the world is rewarding just for being in the world, then you've, you've kind of already won in a lot of respects because everything else is a bonus, which is what Shadow of the Colossus really, really gets. You know, it's, it's just being in that world is, is hugely rewarding. Mm. Like the way you mentioned of Deus Ex, like I had Tom Francis on last season to talk of Deus Ex and... Like obviously, if you if you know of Tom Francis, like he'll get into that game in such length, in such detail, taking apart game systems and mentioning anecdotes of how he managed to kind of combine one gameplay system with another gameplay system within that game. Like, was is Stalker kind of similar in that regard? Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's you know, there's a lot going on in it um, in terms of the juggling of different types of. Uh, all the different stats you've got, kind of the weight limits, the combat systems, the the way in which the artifacts play off against that, and the different anomalies. It's, there's, you know, when you start chucking the A life system at the top of that as well, and you've got a lot of things that will just do their own thing. You know, if you don't interact with them, it's it's a really complicated system, and you kind of feel it. You know, it, it's, it's you can feel where it was a, an incredibly ambitious system, and probably a little over ambitious in places. And it was in development for like four hundred years. I mean, it kind of it, it must have been just about to come out and put back and cancel I forgot I think it was first place to come out like four years before it came out or something like that so they were kind of doing stuff in it that is incredibly modern in terms of you know it's really the you know Stalker's the A-Life system is doing stuff which we kind of like rave about happening in Far Cry 3 or 4 but you know like years earlier um, and you, you can feel that they're pushing quite hard against the boundaries of what's actually possible but there's something really it's like you get a kind of a far cry experience without all the requirement to put a billion markers and sub quests and collectibles into the whole thing which makes it a really interesting kind of combination of very very modern game design but without the kind of hang up of we've got to let the player kind of ease them through this and make sure they know where they're going and kind of look after them. It's a bit kind of like someone's parachuting you into into Kirat, but they just kind of cut the cores on the parachute when you're halfway down and go, that's it, you're on your own now. Um, and that's really, really interesting. That's a, it's a, it's a quite an unusual thing. I'm not sure if it would get made now. I'm not sure if you would kind of... I've always wanted Ubisoft to do this. I was really kind of... Um, I haven't played Primal yet, so maybe they're doing Primal, but in, in 4, I wanted to be able to just turn all that stuff off. And just go, just give me, give me a mode which just puts me in it, and I've got nothing. And it's all about me making my own maps, me figuring out my own landmarks, managing my own kind of resources and stuff like that, and not having the temptation to go, right, what have I haven't I done? I'll just go and find, I'll go and find another bit of Shangri-La or parchment, and then I've done that. Now I'm going to go over there because I know if I do X, Y, Z, I get this. And the game, I mean, not for everyone, I mean, I'm quite, I'm quite, I think it's, I find it very hard to resist that stuff as a gamer to go, I'm going to find all the collectibles in this area or I'm going to level everything up before I do the main missions. And you kind of end up not playing the being in the world for being in the world. The world, again, just becomes this, this problem to be solved or this, this, this seem to be mined until you've got everything out of it. And you're not really engaging with it as a world in quite the same way. Um, and Far Cry games are at their best for me, they're the most enjoyable when you can kind of get yourself away from the mini-map for five minutes and just go into the world and just kind of have fun with it and play with it. Um, so Stalker kind of had all that, I think. But it also had this, you know, the, the, the kind of story, the concept was, was, was absolutely fantastic. They really took something, took a really interesting idea and quite a unique kind of feel. And I think the fact that it was made in... in, in Ukraine was had a big part of that. It felt like really, really different um, in terms of the emotional tone and mood of it. Mm, made it feel real, basically. Yeah, it really did. It really did. And there was kind of something about sort of like the it's like kind of miserable and, and shitty there as well. And uh, yeah, I can't tell you about the ends because you haven't played it. But it's got a game which has seven endings, 
um, two of which you can't get unless you do a side mission, which is barely signposted. And the other five are the result of things that it's tracking you doing during the game, but it doesn't tell you it's tracking them. And there's no visible kind of window onto the tracking. It just tracks you and then gives you one of five endings, depending on what you've done. Without telling you it's going to do it, I think that takes a lot of balls. But, you know, particularly, again, in that, you know, in terms of when it was, this is, um, what, 2000 and... Was it 2004 it came out? Six, I think it was, was it? Six. Um, yeah, it was just like, you know, they were just doing it just their way, really, without any sort of thing of, of, of what it... Oh, 2007, actually, it's even later. Yeah, it was 2007, yeah, I just checked. It's like they didn't, you know, they kind of went, okay, we vaguely kind of understood rules of how shit was going to work, but actually, you know, we're just going to do this over here, right or wrong, good or bad, we'll make it this way, and then we'll worry about it later. And that gives it a quite unique feel, I think. It doesn't feel like it was designed by committee or marketers. It feels like it probably had kind of marketers and, and kind of account managers banging their heads against the wall for years going, what the fuck are they doing now? Stop. <laughs> I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure that's how THQ operated at that time, I was. Yeah, yeah, it's fairly just sort of like, yeah, fuck it, it'll be all right. I'm more, <laughs> more of that, that'll be all right. <laughs> um, well, I want to touch upon the game's AI um, because it was so far advanced for its time. Um, like it was a core factor of the game if not the core factor of the game and like I read somewhere that it even had to be toned down essentially because it could even finish the game by itself yeah I've heard this I don't know if it's true or not but there was a point that yeah, they were saying could the at one point the um, other stalkers in the world would race for the centre of the zone if they got to the wish granted before you that's how the game would end <coughs> and I kind of want that to be true I don't know if it is or not um but apart from that's just that's just the craziest idea ever. I love the idea that you, an NPC could get there before you. Brilliant. <laughs> Completely insane in terms of actual game design. Imagine the kind of like the rage quits you'll have at that. You're playing the game, you're 20 hours in, and then it comes up when it says Stalker Bob has reached the wish granter, and then the credits roll, and you sit there going, "What the fuck? <laughs> Brilliant! I should have put it in." <laughs> oh, I can just picture myself now just sitting here like. I don't know. Let's 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 use for example a new Far Cry. Ubisoft puts in this kind of AI system, and uh, it's you as the player. The antagonist is this advanced AI. You have to reach for X, Y, Z certain goal. Yeah. And the you've put in what I don't know twenty five, thirty hours in, and then the AI gets there before you. And it tells you AI, AI has reached this objective before you. Game over. Credits roll. Like. Fuck, that's the worst forty pound I've spent on a game. Yeah, kind of be great. Might be a bit of Far Cry Four better as well. Like, <laughs> <laughs> <Are> you good thing has <laughs> decided he's he's had enough. He's off. <laughs> I found no Far Cry Four that I, I I the, the frustration I had behind it was Pagan. I, the only person I wanted to side with was Pagan Ming because it was so po faced the rest of it, and he was the only one who was making me laugh, and it actually made me think like, yes, this is this is kind of getting back to the good old days of Far Cry 3 of literally there must be someone in the world we haven't offended yet can we just write a bit in to make sure we cover that as well and Far Cry 4 just felt like it was kind of a bit of an apology for Far Cry 3 and that like, we're actually going to take this quite seriously now I mean like Pagan Ming was like this kind of I don't know joker figure in the middle of it or the one place where it felt like they were going let's not take it too seriously at the same time um, apart from the, the best it's still my favourite line of dialogue in, in a game in recent years where you get the quest to go and shoot the white rhino and um, AJ goes that's a rhino that's like an endangered species that's really really you know oh should we be doing this and then he goes uh, the comment who's excuse the mission says oh don't worry say what you want about Pagan Ming he's a brutal dictator but his endangered species breeding programme is amazing we've got more snow leopards and white rhinos than we know what to do with I just kind of went boom <laughs> rock that's just so awful and it's brilliant so yeah, that's that's Far Cry is best that kind of line for me. <laughs> no, you've tempted me to get back into Far Cry Four again. It's worth it for those things. It, it's kind of it has a lot of it. I just kind of went, oh, I don't know. Um, I think the difference between Far Cry Three and Four for me was in Three, you flamethrowed a field full of ganja with Skrillex playing, and you felt like a god amongst men when you were doing it. Oh yeah, you did. Before you had to take out a heroin film, and then they go. Of course, we have to tell you now about this, the moral implications of both destroying the heroin field and not destroying the heroin field. I kind of put my head in my hands and went, yeah, I want Skrillex, I want the flamethrower, I just want to just 
just go, I'm playing a Far Cry game and I can be as stupid as I want. I don't want a moral lecture at this point. So, yeah. Although, to be fair, like that was kind of how Far Cry 2 worked. Like It was that more, whereas Far Cry 3 just basically went up shit and just goes like, here's the yeah. crazy... But I would take. I mean, I really enjoyed Far Cry Four, I really, and don't get me wrong, I, 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 you know, I had a lot of fun with it. But it felt like Two did what it did really, really well and unapologetically. Three did what it did really, really well and unapologetically. Four tried to work out if it was better to do Two or Three, and tried to do something in the middle and have it both ways, and kind of showed that you kind of can't. Mm. And it couldn't work out if it was supposed to be being serious or funny and it would kind of do something and then it would kind of realise it had done something really appalling and it would kind of pull back and go no no actually this is quite serious we have to think about this and then it would be serious what well, and then it would go oh do you know fuck it I can't do this anymore let's just do something mental instead and it kind of kept going backwards and forwards and it was it was yeah it was funny it was a bit like I used to feel this very much about um, Fallout 3 where I'd just go just, just figure out if you're doing a comedy or a serious game and then come back to me but I don't know that it's... I think it's really hard to go backs and forwards across that line. Um, I don't think anyone's... I'm not sure anyone's really managed it yet. Um, maybe one day. You mentioned Fallout, and, like, Stalker, like, it gives you ways to treat your ailments. You, like, you could treat bleeding from stab wounds or gunshot wounds and hunger and elements of that, like... Elements of that system, like it felt like Far Cry, uh, sorry, not Far Cry, but actually, no, that's true. It did feel like, to a lesser extent, Far Cry 2, but also Fallout as well. I mean, I suppose it had a fairly, it was kind of like a, an experience pointless RPG. It's a light RPG system going on in there because you are doing a lot of inventory, inventory, bleh, inventory management and the kind of question of which artifacts you picked up and knowing that the artifacts would basically irradiate you and you start getting radiation poisoning but they'd give you other stat bonuses and you're switching them around and kind of figuring out your loops and your arm and that kind of went on with the into um, Clear Sky and Core Pripyat with um, uh, kind of weapon modification systems and things like that so it always had quite a sort of an RPG like element to it which I really liked, I and mean, it kind of it definitely gave it kind of a, a fair bit of depth and interest. And I think the third one, they really, really got it nailed in in Call of Pripyat um, in terms of balancing that. Like, I don't think the artifacts worked as well in that game, oh, but it kind of had that sort of thing of it did feel quite RPG. But it the thing which always bugged me about um, about Fallout Three, which I haven't played Fallout Four yet, but someone I work with who has says they they've sorted this out in it that. That I really, really annoyed me as a shooter player. I, mean, I could line up a shot perfectly and do something with kind of like skill, and then it would like say I've missed because my uh, my scores weren't high enough, and that used to drive me absolutely mental when I was playing it. I really, really disliked it because I'd be like, "Don't, don't make me shit if I've done something good. If I've done something shit, fine, okay, I'll take the heat for it. But but if I if I've been really, really clever, it's really annoying to be told I'm not good enough because my character isn't. And kind of stalker because it was a shooter with RPG elements. It gave you enough of that stuff to make you feel like you were kind of responsible for what was going on. You had to make choices. You had to be a little bit smart. You had to hide stuff. I mean, it was just great, the idea that you'd actually, you know, other stalkers would wander around the world, and if they found your shit, they'd just pick it up and wander off with it. So if you were trying to leave yourself little stashes of kind of like anti-radiation drugs and food and stuff like that or ammunition or if you had too many weapons to carry so you couldn't actually move very fast so you'd make your own little stashes around the world but then you get into these really cool places like if I can climb up into that tree and I can balance a sniper rifle on that branch with the in-game physics nobody's going to find it it's going to be there if I want it later on and it kind of you had that kind of dimension to it that it wasn't just I'm just like a, a gun mule where basically I can carry everything you had to make those choices you had to think a little bit like an RPG yeah. but it was it was pretty light um, and I think that's that's a hard thing to kind of do and again it's it's quite you know it felt like quite ahead of its time that those kind of things it's it is you look at something like a modern Far Cry game and it does have those kind of RPG light elements to it of a little bit of crafting a little bit of a progression tree um, a little bit of choice you know of of what you carry in inventory management Um yeah, I mean, it's really funny. The more we talk about it, the more I'm kind of going, yeah, Stalker's like, like it's, it's like a really good blueprint for, in an alternate world, it's like an alternate world Far Cry. Hmm, mm, absolutely. Um, oh, fuck. 
Have you just seen Twitter? Uh, Lion Lionhead's closing. Oh my god! Microsoft has cancelled Fable Legends and Project Knoxville, and the fate of the two studios involved now hangs in the balance. Fable Legends was to be a cooperative entry in the long-running RPG series, while Project Knoxville was to be a cooperative survival game. Press Play Studios is shutting down, but the status of Lionhead is still up in the air due to the UK's mandatory 30-day consultation period. Oh, fuck. Have you just seen Twitter? Uh, Lionhead's closing. Oh my god! Just said Lionhead's closing. Jess has just texted me. My phone's just gone boom, and it's Jess going, Lionhead's closing, Lionhead's closing. Oh my god. Oh my god, I can't believe this. It says, after much consideration, we have decided to cease development on Fable Legends and are in discussions with employees about the proposed closure of Lionhead Studios in the UK. Holy fuck! That's just huge. Oh my god. Oh fuck. Oh, that's loads of people. That's really shitty. That's oh a... my god. That's. Oh fuck. <laughs> That's I, the air, isn't it? Bloody hell, it is. Fable 2, man. Fable 2. I love that game. Fuck. That's a lot of people's jobs. That's really grim. I just really... I mean, that's what you want, is that there's so many good developers at line. I just hope they fall on their feet and they're not all just hung out to dry because they deserve to be working in this industry. They're good people. Jesus Christ. That's insane. Oh, fuck, man. That's uh it's gonna that's gonna put a bit of signal now. Uh Yeah. It's worth noting that since the recording of this episode, Lionhead unfortunately closed down at the end of its thirty day notice period as per UK law. We wish everyone who's affected the best of luck as of this episode going out and we hope that you've landed on your feet since then. With that being said, let's continue with the rest of this episode on Stalker Shadow Chernobyl with Dan Pinchbeck. Enemy wise then of Stalker, like the enemy design, like it how did you find the design for, for those enemies? Because like there was snorks who were kind of the most human of the lot to the pseudo giants that were, that were basically this quote well, unquote giant mutated ball of humans. Yeah, they were. Um, I think it was never the strongest point in the game, really, the monster design. But they had like the pseudo giants were were a bit naff um, and never very very scary. The snorks were kind of okay. Um, the ones that really it really did it though was the, the poltergeists um, so you had the, the bloodsuckers who could turn invisible and that was like the first time you met one of those it was just like oh okay that's just terrifying but the first, I remember going down into um, oh, is, it, is it I can't remember if it's X10 or X12 I think it's the X10 labs and I went down there and there was like nothing happening and suddenly these boxes lifted off the floor and started chucking around and suddenly I would get sort of like belted and, and hit with kind of like barrels and compressed air canisters and it took me probably about five, ten minutes before I actually kind of cl- clocked the poltergeist ball of light and was able to target it. And they're bullet sponges as well, so you're hammering away, trying to hit these balls of light as they're going around. And it was just absolutely terrifying. I had no idea what was going on. Absolutely. I didn't even know there was a monster down there. I didn't know if it was an anomaly. I didn't know if it was something I'd done. Whether it was like an impassable place that I couldn't get there. And it was that kind of curveball. That was where it was at its best. I think... The kind of the dogs were great and the boars and they're they all really kind of nice and this kind of thing, but it kind of it just excelled when it was um, these creatures that you, you, it really took you a while to get their logic and you had the um, the controllers as well who did that thing where they'd psychically attack you but the camera would zoom right in at them and then fire right back out again and then you'd drop all of your guns which is a brilliant bit of it because you'd be like they would hurt you and it would knock your gun out of your hand. So then you're scrabbling around in the dirt, in the dark, looking for your rifle, which has got stuck halfway through a wall because the physics are a bit wonky. And you're there sort of going, I can't get my gun, I can't get my gun, this thing, this thing's attacking me. And it's, that was the kind of the, the, the sort of frantic panic of it when it really, really worked well. Um, but it's interesting that all of those, the, the bloodsucker and the poltergeist and the controller, you didn't see them very much. And when you did see them, you didn't see an awful lot of them. And those were the things which made them scary because again because it's about your imagination going there is something in the dark which is killing me i don't know what it is or really where it is or even if i can kill it that's frightening um i think the best one of the other um companies that did it really not surprisingly did it really well because it's effectively the same company it was 4a did it with the librarians in 2033 where 
they're such massive bullet sponges. I think I played the whole, the, the whole library section the first time I played it, thinking you couldn't actually kill them and just running away from them. And it made that whole sequence absolutely terrifying. And I was absolutely gutted when I found out you could actually kill them because it made them so much less scary. It just made them a nuisance. Um, but yeah, I think that that Stalker kind of understood that what you're really afraid of is you're really afraid of the dark. Um, and it was that that made it really... Going down into those labs was just terrifying. It still is, even though I know the, 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 the layout of them backwards. It's still really scary because it's really, really dark and you can't actually really see what's going on properly. And I think the other complete unsung hero about Stalker is the audio design is just stellar. It's so good. Um, they're kind of creature noises and kind of like ambient loops that you're in when you're in the zone. It's so atmospheric. They just did. They'd be kind of, you'd be going down into a lab and you'd hear a bloodsucker somewhere down there in the lab underneath you. You just have to think of going, I just don't want to go down there. I know I have to but I just don't want to. And he tipped going down the stairs one step at a time, thinking sooner or later it's going to hit me. I'm not going to see it when it hits me because it'll be invisible and coming out of the dark. And then I'll spray like a clip of ammunition off randomly, panicking, that will miss it because it's invisible. Use all of my ammunition so I've got no way of actually surviving this encounter. And if I'm really lucky and I manage to kill it, I'm still going to be bleeding to death by the time I leave this lab. And um, I'm probably not going to make it back home to base camp again. And that sense of just, I'm just fucked, is really, really unusual. Um, I, I did, um, a few years ago, when I was still an academic, I wrote a book about Doom, and I was really, really lucky that I got to go over to, to Id and um, talk to a bunch of them, and, and like, they were all like really amazing, and like, John Romero is really, really, um, really kind of generous with his time as well. And um, I think it was... Um, I think it might have been Tim Willis who said it. He said, the real thing about Doom is that you should always feel like you're completely fucked. And that's it. You've had it. But you somehow survive by the skin of your teeth constantly. Mm-hmm. And that's why it feels so great. And kind of Stalker had that as well. If you, you, you kind of never felt comfortable. It was always, you weren't quite sure what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that kind of drifted away from monster design. But yeah. Mm, that, that's what it felt like for me when I was first playing through uh, Ravenholm in Half-Life 2 it was that uncertainty of it for me that kind of made me feel scared if you get what I mean like, cause that yeah, was, yeah. Cause it was just creepy as fuck it was so terrifying and um, like, I'm trying to figure, figure out because it has been so long since I've played Half-Life 2 because like, the first time I played Half-Life 2 was with the Orange Box on Xbox 360 but when I like, I already thought like Half Life Two was a kind of scary game as is. Even without going through Ravenholm at the time, because like, you had it was it was the atmosphere of the game. It was the tense atmosphere that City Seventeen gave. But it was once you went through Ravenholm, and that I just felt, oh fuck, I I don't want to go through this. I don't want to go through this. I don't want to go. Yeah, through this. I mean that's I me. Mean, that's it. I mean that that brilliant. You know, and you can actually really get get yourself into that sort of state as a player of going, don't want to go forwards. And like the games that have managed that, I mean, Dark Descent is a brilliant example of a game which manages that. We just go, no, I don't want to do that, and you kind of know you have to. But you also know that a lot of the stuff which is going on, you're generating that yourself, and it is the real kind of like Stephen King. You know, I know there's nothing under my bed, and I know that if I keep my feet under the covers, it can't grab me. It's your own imagination that's making it. And again, and that's another thing of going. You know, that's about leaving space for the player's imagination because you can't, it's virtually impossible to scare a player with anything you've got on the screen, but it's much easier and I think much more powerful to, if you can convince a player to start scaring themselves, you're in business. What do you think is the kind of legacy Stalker has left behind for itself, the standard that it's left as a first person shooter and maybe to a lesser extent as a horror game, but what's, either way, what's the standard it has left, has it left as a game basically? Um, I think it's probably one of those games which is a lot more... I mean, you know, it's, it's loved by PC players. I think it's, it's the... In a lot of ways, it's the high watermark of PC shooters because it was so tight. I think... I don't think you'd have games like DayZ without Stalker. I think it was probably the first to actually introduce kind of anything resembling crafting elements into a shooter, even though it wasn't really crafting, but it kind of had that sort of feel to it, that sort of junky feel. Um, I think 
aside from obviously you then have the two the two metro games which are a, a direct product of it i think if i don't know it's a really weird one really if, if esther is an important game then 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 it must stalk must be an important game because stalk was hugely influential for us and still is i think on all of our games it's it's, it's kind of it's a real i think my love of stalker manifests in everything we do um and not just in the games we'll be going forwards. I can I can see elements of Stalker in, in what I want to do and the way I want to design. And certainly it was the game more than any other in kind of like for me as a as a kind of a, a designer now, but I, I kind of go back to and go that feeling, that sense, that that atmosphere there. I think I'm probably not alone. I think there are probably a lot of designers who kind of go to it and go, that game is really important. I know that you know Jim Rosignol absolutely loves it. Um, and there's definitely a lot of stalker DNA in Serbia being hunted. I think you, you kind of see those games, really, really good modern games, and you get a little bit of stalker in that. You can kind of just feel it in there, lurking in the background, like a little radioactive artifact. Um, so it's not a game I think that will ever make it onto best game ever lists because um, it doesn't have, because it is buggy, it's flawed, um, it's quite niche, it's quite difficult and problematic but I think it's a real game developers game and that's you know I think it's a, you know for game fans as well obviously it's a really important game but I think there's a lot of developers who would say you know Stalk is a really important game because it kind of it showed the importance of atmosphere it showed the importance of space um, of not at a time when really everyone was saying really you know, kind of innovation is, is kind of happening in the indie sector, it was a big budget game that was just that really went for it in a lot of ways and didn't always hit the target it was aiming for, but it always it never didn't go for it. And that really shows often it still feels very, very, very different. Um, and that's hard. That's really, really hard. It's hard to make a game that feels different at the best of times. It's really hard to make a game which is ostensibly a traditional RPG shoot a splice that has a really unique identity and personality that's incredibly hard to do um, so I think it's I think it's like you know it's never going to be something which is going to be like Legend of Zelda or something which everyone goes oh you know greatest game ever but I think you know give me give me a snork over Link any day of the week <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned in part there Stalker 2 um, a while ago and what could have been from that but at the same time, GSC has been revived as well. GSC Game World, like it's currently working on a strategy game, so nothing's off the table. It could come back. No, I know they still. Own, it's just, this is that obsessional fan um, uh, confession. They still own all the trademarks and everything. They're still alive. So I might. I definitely didn't look at those to see if they were available to buy. Um, yeah, they. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's. It's. I hope so. I mean, they were good doing a TV show a few years ago. Around about the time they cancelled Stalker 2, there was like a pilot for a TV show in Russia, you know. So I think it's, I think it's a powerful IP that would, would stand a reboot, and I think it would have the fan base for a reboot. I think it would be interesting to see what they did in light of how ahead of its time it was that you have a lot of those things that it was doing, which you now find in a lot more modern games, where it would go. But I think... I think the root of Stalker was always the same. They they just understood that world and they made such a good job of presenting it. And I think if that's what they go back to, then yeah, absolutely. Why not? It'd be brilliant. Love it. So, uh, such junkie for Stalker over here. <laughs> um, at the same time, though, like it is working on a strategy game. Is that is that something you you're going to keep an eye on? <laughs> I'm so bad at that sort of game. It's like puzzle games. I stink at puzzle games. So I find it really, really stressful. I don't find it rewarding in the slightest. Like, I get, they can get a briefest instance of elation if I complete a buzz puzzle. I just feel a crushing, overwhelming sense of despair that I'll have to do the next puzzle and then I'll feel stupid all over again. So, probably not. I'll probably keep an eye on it loosely in terms of they're a really interesting developer, but it's not, it's not a genre that excites me. I just, mainly, because I'm just not very good at them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm keeping very, very close eye on, on, on Severi. I've played that a few times. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's coming on. I'm just waiting for that to go to really get a sort of single-player exploratory part into it, aside from just a reissue multiplayer, which is I'm not, not bothered about. But I understand why they've lost stock of 
had to start with that to kind of make sure they get in kind of an income in. But I really hope that they they push back because they could, you know, I think I'm more at the moment more optimistic that Vostok, if they do well, will make something which will be as close to Stalker as you're ever going to get. Um, and I'm not sure what 4A are doing at the moment. I mean, that's the other thing is that, you know, you have kind of, I think Stalker's legacy really lived on in Metro. Hmm. Um, I don't know what their next plans are, but, but they're always a company that I have high hopes of turning around and producing something that's got the same kind of soul to it as the Stalker stuff did. Um, like 4A moved from Ukraine after what happened there in the country a few years ago with the um, kind of uprising there uh, yeah. that thing that was happened in, happened in Crimea and um, yeah they moved over to Malta so I don't know what they've been doing but um, yeah we just touched upon it there the kind of um, the kind of legacy like, stock or leave is the Metro games if nothing else like how, how, how have you found the Metro games I do um, I, I I love 2033 again for all its flaws I mean it's got issues quite quite a few flaws um, I I thought last night was really interesting because it was a really interesting case study of where actually everything sharpened up, but something got lost, and the something that got lost was really a bit sad because it just didn't feel had the same sense of place as Metro did. It felt like Metro is a real labour of love, and Last Light was a, a a sequel, and that kind of do you know what I mean? It had some amazing moments in it. Um, I mean. Politically, I struggled with it a lot. I thought it's it's the way that it represented female characters was was pretty unforgivably last century. Um, I don't need kind of lap dancers in a in a shoe. It just was shit and pointless. Um, and that had did quite a long way towards spoiling the game for me because, like, every time a woman came on screen, I was like, "Oh fuck, it's gonna be more tit physics now." And um, yeah, that was really disappointing. Um, it, it was good. It was competent, apart from that. Um, but it just Metro, I think 2033 was just, it was like it had everything that Stalker had. It had that complete weirdness to it. And they did get that in places in Last Light. There was some stuff in Last Light that really had that amazing kind of sense of, I literally don't know what is going on there. But I feel that this is a real space and a real place. Um I thought the ghost sequence in 2033 was, was one of the most amazingly atmospheric bits of a shooter in, in, in the last decade. And there was stuff like the, the bear sequence in Last Light was, was fantastic. It was really, really good. Um, and, and Pavel, the NPC, was, was really well written in it um, and really sort of enjoyed... Again, it was kind of like in the Drake side, he enjoyed spending time with him. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. They've got, they've, they've got, I think, in both games, they prove that they are... They do environmental storytelling as well as anybody working in the industry at the moment. They're one of the best companies for environmental storytelling. And all the stuff with the stations is fantastic. Um, I hope that the game they're working on is a game that they are as passionate about as they were with 2033. It just felt like that passion wasn't quite there as much with Last Light, and I think it showed. And I think they put stuff in to cover up for the fact that the passion wasn't there. And it felt a little bit more like someone was saying, you need to put this sort of thing in, you need to put that sort of thing in. Um, 2033 just felt like they kind of went, it's this. And it's a very, very specific thing. And this is what it is. This is our template. This is what we're making. Um, so, yeah, I think if they have that kind of like um, fix and passion on it, whatever they're doing now, I think it'll be exceptional. Mm, absolutely. Um, is, there, is there any other games that have kind of lived up to this kind of legacy of soccer besides the Metro games that? you feel what kind of stood up to the plate um i mean it's, it's weird in a way cause, i mean i've got you know I'm, i've got very low brow tastes with games you know i'm a i'm a massive shooter junkie and <laughs> i kind of like you know my my idea of, of a great gaming session is just cause three it's just how many things can i tether together and how big can i make the explosion so weirdly i don't play a lot of slow paced atmospheric games that much um i think Obviously, there's a lot in the, the open worldness and the emergence and kind of chaotic elements of, of Stalker that I love that, you know, makes me play a lot of Far Cry games as well. Um, and I think that I don't mind something where there's like the odd bugginess about it if it's doing something that feels quite 
Um, like kind of they were just sort of going, you know what, it'll be all right, just do this. And it doesn't matter. I mean, if it breaks a bit, it's fine because actually what we might get um, will risk 10% of the players something going horribly wrong if we may stand the chance that 20% of the players will get something really extraordinary and unpredictable. So I really like sort of like the open world games for that life far cry, like, like Just Cause, that have that much more sort of immersion dynamic system in them. Um, I think... In terms of just sort of like raw atmosphere, I'm trying to think really. It's, it's, there's not, I, I, I struggle with this. I don't find many games particularly have it. I didn't even really feel like The Last of Us had it that much. In places it did, but it was very, I felt like The Last of Us was very, um, very, very good at player psychology, but I felt like I could tell I was being maneuvered a lot mm. um, psychologically and emotionally um, manipulated. And that that kind of jarred occasionally in it. Um, I think weirdly, the game which I enjoyed most last year, which had nothing to do with Stalker at all, was Until Dawn, which I thought was, was a fantastic game, um, and really sucked me in in a way probably more than any other game last year. Just completely thought it was wonderful. Um, so yeah, I don't know really. No, it's, I think it still feels fairly fairly unique. I don't find there are moments in shooters that feel Stalker esque, but. I'm also aware that, you know, it's very, very hard to get out from underneath your own sense of nostalgia. And I try and sort of bear that in mind as well, that a lot of the games I talk about, I go, this game was amazing, it was just amazing. And you kind of go, well, I, I'm not sure. You just loved it at the time. You're sure you're not carrying that with you. And I think that's something which we have a bad tendency to do as, as gamers. I think it's a real thing that we do in gaming culture is we're very, very nostalgic. Mm. Uh, so I try and be a little bit wary of that as well with myself because, yeah, I'm aware it's probably... There are bits of it that, if actually looked objectively, I'd go, well, that's a bit painful. So, what else do you like about Stalker that we've not been able to touch upon? Oh, I see, we covered sound design. We talked about AI, world design. Um, I can't talk about the ends. The ends are brilliant. The ends are fantastic. They're so much fun. I remember the first time we got the ending, I was just sitting there going, I didn't know about the side quest and the alternative two endings. When it got to the end of the game, the game ended. I was sat there with my jaw hanging open, going, "I cannot believe you've just done that to me." What well, I don't even know what it means. It's mental. I feel kind of cheated, but elated, but just mainly just freaked out and weirded out by it. That's really got to be, yeah. I think it's 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 kind of hard without wanting to give anything away about the ends. But the the, the seven endings of Stalker, particularly the first five, are are really quite special. Um, and it got me into it. it you know, it took me to. Um, to, through to the book, which I wouldn't have read otherwise. And, it, it, you know, without, I played Stalker, loved it, did a sort of bit of background reading, found out about Boris and Arcady's road, Boris and Arcady Strugatsky's Roadside Picnic. And Roadside Picnic is one of the greatest sci-fi novels ever written. It's just extraordinary. Absolutely. Everyone should read it. Um, certainly anyone who's interested in, in science fiction has to read it. It's a, just a, one of the, the best sci-fi books ever written. Um, so I'll always be very grateful for, to, to Stalker for that. Mm. and that uh, is influential on, on us as game developers as the game I would say probably mm. um, what didn't you like about Stalker like obviously we've touched upon how it's buggy and all that there like it's kind of riddled with bugs but like uh, the, the writing's really bad um, and the voice acting's not much cop and obviously as a writer that's supposed to be quite important to me <laughs> um, and I did toy with for, for quite a while um, about because it's all in um, like Excel spreadsheets and stuff like that about rewriting it. I thought that could be quite good fun, but I just literally haven't had time. But maybe one day I'd quite like to to just take the game and just rescript it because um, I think it's it's there's some really good ideas in there. It's just not necessarily very well written a lot of it, and that can be a bit kind of like a bit cringy in places. Um, Clear Sky was pretty appalling, um, and. Yeah, I think just the difficulty with it is, is you want more. I mean, that's the only moaning negative about it is, is that it's. It was a shame that I understand why they cut as much as they did, but when you go back to seeing the environments which got cut from the game, which were there originally, the whole sort of dead city places and things like that, you kind of it's difficult not to go. Oh, I could have had twice as much stalker, um, and it's hard cutting games. I mean, it's so hard to do it anyway. So if it was Far Cry size, if it been made now and it was Far Cry size, I'd be a happy, happy man. <laughs> Um, what would you change from a design perspective then in terms of Stalker like what, what tweaks would you make what, what design choices would you change I think 
it would be if I was going to go into it now and change it now I'd overhaul all the monsters I don't think they're as good as they could be I think they could be definitely weirder you could get away with with a lot more in terms of not understanding how they worked um, and I think the anomalies and the artifacts are you learn them very quickly uh, by the time you're halfway through the game they're not as threatening apart from if you're being stupid or not looking where you're going um, and they kind of always struggled a little bit this over the course of the three games about how many different artifacts there should be and I think it really worked and then you go out and you read Road Type Picnic and Road Type Picnic is so evocative in terms of the names of the anomalies and the artifacts that you kind of when you go back to it and you kind of go okay so I've got this one it comes out this anomaly and it's got three classes of kind of like weak medium and amazing um, and they've got this artifact and this produces these ones weak medium amazing and the system of that becomes quite um, uh, quite gamey quite early on and I think they tried to make them more unique in clear skylight there were less of them but then there were problems with that that you'd kind of exhaust the artifacts at a level you wouldn't get any more and it made it didn't really work as well but I think they could have injected a lot more. I think even, you know, kind of injected something that was quite procedural into that of actually going, you don't know, we're not going to have any kind of guarantee of what these things do. And we're going to hide what these things do a bit more from the player. So rather than going, I've picked up something that gives me plus five rupture, but minus five radiation, I've picked up something, but it's going to be me just checking my scores to see what that does. And I won't even know that it's poisoning me until like half an hour later if I'm not keeping an eye on it. So I think that was that there was room to play with more ambiguity in that system there. Uh, so obviously there's only been three stalker games like there's been uh, Shadow Chernobyl Cobb for Pierre and Clear Sky so I don't really need to ask for your top three because it's only been for, no, <laughs> three but how would you rank it anyways like uh, Chernobyl at the top obviously yeah and then Pripyat and Clear Sky Clear Sky tried to do too much with faction wars and you can see where they were going they were trying to put a multiplayer angle on it but it just ended up being shootouts between factions and the story was a bit naff um, Pripyat they took it down to three levels and made each one of those levels open world, which was really interesting. And you could see where they were going in terms of stitching the entire zone together into one super world, which would have been, I think that was probably where they were going to stalk to. Um, I hope it was anyway. And that would have been amazing, really, really amazing. Um, Pripyat is great for the first two levels and then narrows down very quickly at the end. And I think the writing of Pripyat really lets it down at the end. Um, the actual end of Pripyat is amazing because they kind of, it's such a massive anticlimax, and it's really kind of funny. I was talking about this with uh, Lewis Denby from Beef Chat once, and he just, we were just talking about it going, it's brilliant, because at the end of it, it's as close to it was all a dream as you can get, where they kind of go, and now we know how to escape the, to escape the zone, let's all go home, hooray! And then he'll get in a helicopter and go home. And that's it. You're going, well, that's not how a game ends, but there's something so amazingly brilliant about how boring and mundane it is. That that's actually what you do. That I kind of really like it. Um, but yeah, so Call of... Um, so Shadow Chernobyl, Call of Pripyat, Clear Sky, in that order, definitely. Um, I don't usually do this, so, but I'm going to throw in uh, an, perhaps an extra option here of possibly, because they're so similar, or as close to similar as you can get with Stalker, the Metro games. So would you throw in any of the Metro games in that top three? Yes. In that case, I would go, you go Shadow Chernobyl, Metro 2033, Call of Pripyat. Mm-hmm. Um, 2033 there was a lot of crossover between the two teams a lot of crossover in fact I think it was the core team of Shadow of Chernobyl which made went on to make 4A and you can really feel it I think it's it feels like a a very similar game made from it like if you had it as a single target like kind of coming at the same thing from two very different directions um, and again what's really interesting I think about both of those games they're both based on books and that's something which you know, I think it's really interesting. You kind of also then look at other games which are about Far Cry 2, you know, also very inspired by a book. I think there's a really interesting thing when you start finding books at the inspiration of games rather than movies, you get something quite different.
yeah, honorable mentions. Go for it. Um, let me see. I've kind of talked about a lot of the games that I really love. So I, I love the Far Cry games. I think for the reasons I've talked about, I think that sense of kind of emerging chaos is really, really good. Um, the Metro games we talked about. I think it's got problems, but I think um, say being hunted is really interesting in terms of there you could really see the inspiration and really that sort of thing of going, let's do something procedural with this, something stealth-based, that kind of sense of threat and everything. And I kind of like Surfo. It's, 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 again, it's so weird. It's so odd, the kind of English kind of like tweed punk, I think they called it, um, kind of idea. You just kind of go, where did that come from? And that's, I, it's, it's really, I still love getting that in games, going, I just don't know where that came from. And I think most games you can still go, yeah, you took this and this and this and put them together and got this, or it fits within that model. So it's nice to have a game where you go, at which point you came up with the idea of jodhpur English robots. is that's, that's fine. Go for it. Run with it over there. Um, I talked about Until Dawn. I really, really liked this year. I think that was terrifically written and very, very well. Some of the best voice acting. Um, and I think, you know, I'm trying to think what, what sort of came out. I mean... The other major kind of like um, game that I've, I've absolutely adored in recent years was um, Deus Ex Human Revolution. I thought was phenomenally good. Um, I'm absolutely just waiting on the edge of my seat for Mankind Divided. But I think that had a really very glossy, much diff- very different in terms of very, very glossy, very controlled, very tightly kind of like scripted and everything else. But again, it had that a really powerful sense of world. You really got the place it was putting you into. Um, particularly kind of like uh, when it was in, um, when you're in China, you just kind of really felt alive, that ecosystem. And you were kind of aware of the walls, but it was very, very easy for you to forget them. You didn't take much of an effort for you to go, this is the corridor I'm in. Um, but I thought, yeah, I really enjoyed that. I think it's, and that's another game that is, you know, it's very, very, very idea driven. Kind of really felt like it had something to say, um, and it wanted to say it, and it, 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 it felt like the game mattered to the team. And if it didn't, they did a very, very good job of making it look like it did matter. So, yeah, I think that's as far as kind of recent shooters go. I think Human Revolution has got to be, has got to be right up there. And I think the other shooter of recent years, which I think is just was just stunning was um was wolfenstein i think machine games did an outstanding job with that um it was such good fun to play so well balanced so well crafted and then that amazing kind of like it's almost like a confidence trick they pulled on you where suddenly halfway through the game you suddenly thought fuck i really care about these people Mm. and god i didn't see that coming Mm. and you didn't see that coming yeah like I'll, i'll say this as well um like Deus Ex and Wolfenstein, like, for such beloved IPs, like, with past histories, like, for Eidos Montreal and Machine Games, respectively, to come in and do their first games ever and have them be based on those properties and do them justice is really fucking good, for a lack of a better term. Yeah, it really is outstanding. It really is. They just came out and just did And I don't know, yeah, they just... Yeah, just... just are really good and they're the kind of games where they go you know I know that there's a lot of them I and mean, God knows there's huge problems with AAA production particularly the, the way the production models work and um, there's so much risk aversion and all this kind of stuff and there's so much kind of you know kind of cookie car stuff being pumped out at the moment and it's really important to kind of like look at games like Wolfenstein and go well, we can still yeah it is still a shooter yes it is cyborg undead Nazis and this kind of stuff but that game had something quite special in it as well um, and you know that can happen that's still something that can happen um, and that's I think it is important because it is quite unusual um, and hopefully it's not getting more unusual, although, you know, kind of the jury's out on that a little bit at the moment. But I think while people like Machine Games are working in, in AAA production, we, we stand a chance. And again, you know, in the light of, of, of the news about Lionhead, kind of going, it's really important to go. There's really, really talented developers out there, really, really talented teams. And it sometimes feel like they make amazing games despite the best efforts of the games industry. Um, and sometimes you get those times and it really, really aligns and, and, and things really, really happen. But, yeah, I think it's 
yeah, Lionhead's a bit of a sobering reminder of the other side of the coin of this, that you can ship, you know, I really like the Fable series. I think Lionhead, a great, great studio, and it's, you kind of go, despite all that, you know, they're gone. Yeah. Like like I said, it's, it's a sobering thought that you kind of process. Um, but, yeah. Um, anyways, um, top three games ever. How would you rank them? Obviously, Shadow of Shinobi is the top, but how else would you uh, fill out the rest of that top three? Um, if it's on a personal taste thing, not on a, I think they're the best games ever. Because sure. I'd have to get into my, well, okay, imagine, in terms of favourites, then I'd go Shadow of the Colossus, then probably um, Soul Reaver, mm. and then probably either Doom or System Shock 2. Mm. Mm. Not sure which one. Very different reasons, I think. Depending on what mood I'm in. Touch upon Rapture because I fucking love Rapture. I cannot even begin to tell you how much I love Rapture. Well, thank so, you. That's I, really I, I, I adore it. So thank you for making it. I really do appreciate it because it has a very personal resonance to me. But I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Um, first off, like, how have you found the reception to it? Yeah, really it, amazing. Really amazing. I think it was always kind of a bit of a leap of faith. Rapture. Um, it was bigger than any other kind of walking sim or game like it had been. The non-linearity was a really big, is this going to work? You know, are we going to be able to do do something where we're going to give over huge amounts of control over the, the art? We don't know if players are going to find half the story in it. You know, are they going to be, we just didn't know. Um, and I think the team, we were really lucky. We had an amazing team who really put heart and soul into it. And... I'm so proud of what they made and for it to have really kind of resonated with people and people to have really got it is it's the best feeling in the world really I think it's I'm so pleased for them I'm so pleased that you know a team that puts so much passion into it can look at it and say what they wanted to say did speak to people um, is yeah it's a really good thing and I, it's just you know I think we've never had any sort of like real big kind of we're doing this or uh, about the industry or like that we just wanted to sort of like you know tell these stories that we believed in a way that hopefully people would want to be told them and would engage with them and, and be into them so you kind of you know when you put something out really what you're just hoping for is that people get it and like it and yeah it's, it's the it's, it's the reason for, for doing it it's the reason for being in the industry it's the reason for making the games is that if it's if you put something out there and, and, and it sort of speaks to people, then that's it. It justifies it, justifies all the work. So it's been really, really amazing, actually. Really great. Well, I'm, I'm genuinely delighted to hear that because I, I, I want to succeed. I want it to succeed. And it's just fantastic to hear that, especially in light of today's news with Lionhead. Like, I, I, games I want to see succeed, studios I want to see succeed, like, it. it for that sober and fall of Lionhead closing, at the same time, it gives me pleasure in seeing studios go out there and experiment with games, like, like with Rapture, with studios, like you, and with the Chinese room. So I'm really glad to see it succeed. Um, um, we've been talking about immersion, like especially in regards to Stalker, and um, I did I recorded the first episode last night uh, of my favourite game, 
um, we uh, had on Alexa Ray Korea of GameSpot, and we were talking just before we were talking of her favorite game, which was Kingdom Hearts: Birth by Sleep. But we were talking about immersion in games and that kind of importance of it. And obviously, we've got into that a lot more today with Stalker. Um, and it's clear now that talking with you for like nearly the past two hours of how much importance immersion is to you. And, mm. that, and that came across especially in Rapture. Yeah, no, it is. It's, it's the central for me. I mean, it really is. If you are immersed in the world, that's... Okay, so we can, we can do excitement in a whole bunch of different mediums. We can have you on the edge of your seat. We can make you jump. We can make your adrenaline throw, sort of like flow. We can tell stories in a lot of mediums. We can kind of like evoke emotions in a lot of mediums. We can't put you inside a world in anything other than a game. It's the one thing that games do which makes them utterly unique to pretty much anything else is that sense of being in it. And I feel like that to me is what makes me, has always made me love games, is I can get in that world and I can walk around it. And that's just, I find that as, as exciting as I did when I was seven. You know, you know, I find that as exciting as I did 35 years ago when I first felt that feeling. Um, it's just amazing. And that's what I want. I want to be able to go, I'm in this world. And then when you've started from that point of going, I'm in this world, and then you start adding all those other things in, when the story comes back in and the things you can do with music and you know the way in which player agency can completely transform that experience as opposed to it being sort of a passive thing, but it kind of fundamentally ties down to that thing of just that sense of just wonder of I'm in this world. And then you kind of, when you start thinking about like, you're like, well, what worlds do we want to put people into? And what does it mean to, to be in that world? And I think with Rapture, it was a real, in terms of the sort of story that we wanted to tell, it felt like the only way of telling that story was to make sure you were in that world where it mattered, because that's how it had its kind of emotional depth to it. It was, you know, what you were bringing to it as a player and how that was playing across what was going on um, in the world around and the feeling of the sense that, you know, it's really important to me that you felt like you knew these people, that you, you, you'd met these people, you were related to these people, you were friends with these people, you've loved these people, you hated these people. These are people that we know. It's us. To take us in that scenario and then actually put you in the middle of it where you can make choices and you have agency, it just felt like that was a, a thing which could only really be with a game. And... It, I don't think Rapture is, I don't think it could break down into being a TV show or a film. Maybe, you know, someone would want to do that. But it feels like it's a, for me as a writer, it was about saying, what can we do that's about writing that is fundamentally a piece of game writing that you couldn't do in another medium? Let's make it non-linear. Let's make it open world. Um, and let's put the player at the heart of the story making choices. And that just felt, yeah, that's that's... It's what games do. It's the thing we've got. It's our. It's the ace up our sleeve as a medium. Um, is we can put you at the centre of it in a meaningful way, and that's that's unbelievably powerful. And that's not something which is very, very often actually kind of made the most of in a lot of games, particularly in game storytelling. You have this agency, and they're far more interactive in inverted commas than Rapture, but it's so 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 superficial. And like you do a lot of stuff and you hit a lot of buttons and a lot of shit goes off in front of you. But a lot of that stuff hides the fact that fundamentally you're on a roller coaster, even in an open world. You're just, you're just jamming buttons with your halo face on, drool, you know. We've all drooled. I drool sometimes. But it doesn't, it's not a deep engagement. It's not deep immersion. I saw, um, God, years ago, year 1999. Was that? God, nearly 20 years ago. That's frightening. I just finished university and I went to this conference I was doing in theatre and there was this, um, this theatre practitioner called Robert Wilson who did like big like extended operas in the 1970s they're like going for like 12 hours and like things would move incredibly slowly or 24 hour operas or theatre shows and this kind of stuff and he was really kind of famous for it and he did this like this, this lecture masterclass thing and he had these um, he had these uh, students on stage and he got me drew two taut lines on the floor six feet apart he said I want you to take five minutes to walk from one line to another line and they didn't have, couldn't look at a clock or anything. Of course, they all did it in about 20 seconds. And he got them doing it until he got one of them to actually take over a minute to walk six feet. And then he turned around and he went, a competent actor can stand on stage and can deliver good lines and hold you. Um, a truly great actor can stand on stage, do absolutely nothing, and you can't take your eyes off them. 
And I think there's a really interesting thing in that for, for game design. And it comes back to the Tibetan village and it comes back to Shadow of the Colossus of going, when nothing is happening in a game and you are fundamentally there in that world, something is really, really right about that design and that experience. And that's a, yeah, that's, a, that's always been something I've gone, if we can do that, we can put you in this world with nothing and you still are in this world, then, then something special has happened there, I think. Mm, absolutely. Um, the other thing that I find really special about Rapture is not just the immersion of it, it's the themes as well. Um, I was uh, Last season I had a guest on who was talking about Rapture as one of her honourable mentions, and one of the underlying themes of the game that we really shared was loss, because she had lost, uh, one of her friends had died, and a year and a half ago um, my mother passed away, and we were kind of just thinking of Rapture as this game of love, loss and really about life as well because for me those are the key pillars to the game and like how, how, how important were those to kind of convey those themes across in the game? I think it was I think there was kind of a sense of we just want, we wanted to make a game about people and about us and say this is not... It kind of came from one of the, the, the sort of early conversations that Jess and I had where we were sort of playing. I think I was playing Fallout and she was sort of watching me play it and I was sort of saying, you know, the real irony about all this sort of stuff is that we kind of hero it all up and that's why this is powerful because it's escapist because we can pretend we'd have the shotgun and the rocket launcher. But actually, that part of Ash over there, that would be us and everyone we knew and everyone we loved, that would be us. And Jess went, that's the game. And it was that sort of thing of going... It started from that thing of going, who are the people actually behind all this sort of stuff? You get all that rubble and detritus in Fallout, and actually it's profoundly sad that you have all these traces of these lives. And then really good games kind of let you into bits of that, those little sort of like backstory bubbles where you get a sense of that little life that went on there. And um, they can be really far more moving and far more kind of engaging than the main plot thrusts a lot of the time, I find. And so it was sort of comes to that point of going, well, look, it comes down to that sort of question of, of what is a life well lived? What's the, you know, what, how do you value a life? Because we are all going to die and we've all, you know, we've lost people and everyone loses people. Mm-hmm. And that's a really important thing. It's an important part of life. But the important part of that is how do you say that given that we know that, how do we celebrate the time that we have and, and what kind of, what is meaningful about the time we have together. And it felt like that was a, it really kind of the idea of, of, of the end of the world kind of came out of that of going, the end of the world is only important because of the things that end with it. Like the end of the world itself is just an abstract kind of thing, but it's that, those kind of interrelationships ending that's the real thing that really matters. And, and the world ends <coughs> every day in small ways for 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 lots of people and you know it kind of it was very much about sort of kind of exploring that and going well does it matter if the world ends if you've lived a really amazing life does it matter if you die if your life's been amazing um how do you make peace with that fact and where is the the sort of the value in it and that kind of notion of 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 the really a life without love is not a life and so I, i think it's funny because Rapture is kind of a game about, about loss, but I think it's, for me, Rapture is mainly a game about love, and it's about a celebration of, of, of the love between people in all its flaws. I mean, you know, there's, there's so many flawed characters in it, but it's really important that they're flawed as well because it gives their, kind of gives their love for each other a meaning. But that's what fundamentally matters about Rapture to me is that you play this game and you go, these people existed because they loved each other, and that's what you take away from it. And if... They loved each other, then their existence had a meaning, and it's okay, and it's okay to let go, and it's okay that they died because they loved. Mm. And I think that was the, that's kind of what we wanted to say with it, really, which is not, it's quite a simple thing, I think. And it was never a really, a game where we wanted to go, we've got this big, profound statement about life and death to make. It's just a, you know, for me, a small little statement, but it's the most important one, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. No, I totally get it. So, in talking with um, Alexa Ray Korea last night, uh, we she was mentioning about how music in games can tell a story. But uh, in regards to Rapture, 
just the score like absolutely <laughs> tells a story I think really well than any other game that I've ever played like it it's actually feels like it's telling you a story um like obviously music is a massive part in regards to rapture but like did you did you think in any way it would be as as important as it did turn out to be in regards to after the game came out because like everybody rightfully it must be said just praised it to the high heavens yeah it's i mean yeah it's 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 a very very special score i think it's a really special score and i think it is um i think what it does like so much of rapture it's so it feels so simple because it's so well done but it's so so complicated um i mean it, the fact that that jess was is at the heart of development from the word go means that she knew the game better than anyone else i think as well as as well as i do anyone did so she was involved in every creative aspect of it she was you know she was there she was working on the story with me she was in the art meetings she was you know involved in understanding what was going on in AI and all of the audio. So it wasn't the music wasn't an afterthought. It was the music was an integral part of the game's development from day one. And I think that's why it's so fundamentally integrated with the game. I think that's just simple. And I think it is for me, if you want to do something truly great with music and games, you can't do it post alpha. You've got to be integrating it from the word go. So Jess was looking at things like every, you know, having every character having a theme and then really clever stuff, which again, you know, isn't always necessarily noticeable. Like she'd have a scene, um, like the say had Charlie and Meg in it, but like Meg would mention Stephen and she'd just really subtly introduce Stephen's theme into the background in the music. And little tiny things like that are going on all the time in the school where it's referencing out or if a character's talking about an event that hasn't happened yet, it'll reference a track which plays while that event is happening elsewhere in the world, just very subtle links backwards and forwards across with it, which is really, really incredibly sophisticated. And I think it's a lot of that kind of almost goes under the radar when you're playing it, but it's just in there, just reinforcing and making connections. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, it's an extraordinary score, but I think that that kind of, it was worked alongside it. And like with all our games, she's often, while I'm writing, she's writing. So the writing that I'm writing is influenced by the music that she's writing, and it kind of goes around the loop, which is really a really amazing way to work. When we first started working on the game, one of the first conversations we had about it, I said that I'll know, I'll feel like we've got where we need to be with the music on the game if you can play the game with the dialogue turned off and still get the broad thrust of the story and still understand what happened here. I think you can. Um, and we talked about having a mode where you could turn the dialogue off and just play it with just music. And in the end, we kind of went, you know, actually, it's probably not such a... It, it felt like it would be taking away something from the vision, but I think you could play it with just the music and without any dialogue in it. And I think you would still understand what happened here, and you'd still have that kind of emotional journey to it. And I think that is testament to how good the score is. I don't think there's many... There's great game scores. I don't think there's many game scores out there which, like you said, tell the story of the game on their own mm. yeah I think it's I think it's I'm, I'm married to it and I run a company with it but I think it's one of the greatest game scores ever written period I think it, it's it's literally up there with the very best that's ever been made no nepotism, nepotism be damned I agree with you it's, like, <laughs> I, I, it's just genuinely breathtaking um, all the awards for Jess please all the awards <laughs>
So we are, I mean, we've had a few months of kind of for the first time in our career, because we've always gone, we finished, like, we were already working on pigs by the time we shipped Esther. We finished pigs, we handed it over to Frictional on a Friday in January, and then started work on Rapture the following Monday. We've actually had time to go, what do we want to make next? Which is amazing, and really, really good, actually. We are working on another game, it's very, very different, it's not first person at the moment, um, it's really different for us, actually. Um, not, we're going to hopefully announce it in the next few weeks, but not quite there yet. We're still prototyping, so it's still changing so much at the moment that we're wary of introducing anything because it might change. But it's going to be quite a radical departure for us. Still very story-driven, still very atmospheric, um, much more gamey than anything we've done before. We're actually going to have proper systems in there and everything. Um, so, yeah, it's really exciting, and it's called Total Dark. And we will reveal more soon, hopefully, as soon as we feel like whatever we're revealing, we're not going to change our minds on a week later. So that'll be cool. And that will be PC. That's an absolute definite given. It's going to be a PC title. Um, it may go to console later if it does well on PC, but it's primarily we're, we're coming straight back into the PC market. And we're still, we've been talking to a few people about uh, another game, which is a bit bigger than, than, than anything we've made before as well. So we'll have to see if anything comes out of that. But um, yeah, it's, it's exciting at the moment. We're, um, we're doing lots of lots of cool stuff. It's really nice to be prototyping and to be building a game again. Um, the downtime is a lot longer and a lot harder than, than you kind of remember it being. Every time you ship a title and you kind of realise you just run into a wall and a wall always hits you far harder than you remember it hitting you before. Maybe I'm just getting old. But yeah, Rapture was a... It took a while for us to kind of go, <laughs> OK, right, what's next? Twitter, yeah, follow us on Twitter. It's just at Chinese Ring. And um, we're doing quite a lot of blogging at the moment, answering people's questions. If they've got questions for us, they can send them to us on Twitter. And we're putting them up on our blog, which is uh, www.chineseroom.co.uk slash blog. So at the moment, we've been answering some questions about Rapture. Um, and we're about to move on to um, start posting some stuff, um, which might well be a lot of that will be posted by the time this comes out, which we're talking about stuff like how we do scoping, how we put together early prototypes, um, how we pitch to a publisher, and a lot of that kind of behind-the-scenes stuff that doesn't often get talked about in game development, um, which is really nice to be able to share that, because we get asked a lot of questions, particularly by startups, about how to do stuff. And we just thought we'd just scoop it all together and just start sort of just not kind of like as a kind of this is how you do it, but just this is what we've done and this is what worked, and try and be really honest about what our experience of, of becoming a game studio has been like. So, yeah, check the website for that. Thanks for listening to my favourite game. Next week, Alex Neonaki on Bloodborne. Until next week, bye bye.